Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. With her grace, intellect, courage, and commitment to justice and equality, Gloria Steinem has changed lives, and it's also made her one of the world's most influential people. Pretty good, right? Pretty good, but well, if I'm one of the world's most influential people, how come it's in such a mess? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, because it was even worse way before you started, but I really, <laughs> truly believe that. I think you've made an enormous difference in people's lives and in the way we think about the world. What I'm interested in, what I'd like you to do is to explain why you call yourself a radical feminist. Well, first of all, I don't think that adjectives are necessary. You know, some people right. call themselves uh, socialist feminists or cultural feminists or environmental feminists. It just is a way of indicating interest and we're all searching for a world in which how we proceed in life isn't dictated by our sex or our race or our class, you know, we're, we're basically after the same goals. But I say radical because I do think in my heart that the division of human nature into masculine and feminine and the false polarization of men and women in order to control women as the means of reproduction was probably the original uh, division. And since radical literally means going to the root, it doesn't mean violent, it doesn't mean, you know, none right. of those none things. None of the it burning just, and right. stuff like it that. It just means going to the root. So it's a way of, of indicating that, that I do believe that this is the, the root of other human divisions. And until we uproot it in the family, uh, we will go on accepting other divisions as well, not only between males and females, but divisions of race and class and ethnicity outside the family. It's such a very basic premise, and, and I'm glad that you define it so that it does cover everybody, because so many people think feminists are only interested in women. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they, they then come to middle class or upper class women, and that we don't care about well, other issues. Well, you know, things. but I think that that, that is um, That's the penalty. From the <laughs> well, also, it's the penalty of making the invisible visible because uh, people can talk endlessly about men and never say only men. Right. <laughs> you know, they men are the whole human race as right. far as they're concerned. Right. Uh, so only we are made to feel defensive uh, 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 for talking about half of it. When we challenge what they've always said. It's a basic question then of power and the distribution of power. Well, yes, is it? yes, it, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It, it is about power. And I think it's about a form of power that is not usually counted uh, because we assume it. And that is power to control reproduction. We, we think about economic power, we think about power as it has to do with class or it has to do with the electoral system. But uh, women, females of all races and ages, you know, may be the last group for whom our domination is confused with nature. You know, people think that that's just the way it is. It's never been any other way. When in fact, for 95% of human history, it seems it was another way. Mm -hmm. And women did uh, control their own fertility and have two or three children two or three years apart and completely understood how to do that. But uh, it, it was the birth of um, territoriality and ultimately nationalism and monotheistic religions and all these things that, that, that made a certain group of guys think they needed more, more, more people <laughs> and force women into having more, more, more children. Thus, they needed to control reproduction, not only to have more, but also to maintain racial divisions, which became very important. I, rem I remember a speech you gave where you connected reproductive freedom to the economy, or that the lack of reproductive freedom, that, that really it's controlled by the market in yeah, a way. Yeah, right. I mean, if you, if you think about it just in terms of what the norm is and what uh, the supposed norm and what we're rewarded for doing. Um, after World War II, for instance, when there, the population had been somewhat decimated and we were supposed to replenish it, then the physical ideal was a kind of Marilyn Monroe, voluptuous yeah. breasts and hips ideal, and we were supposed to go home to the suburbs and have babies. Then we had enough babies and suddenly it was twiggy and a skinny, <laughs> you know, no, so so it, it's it, it's it's totally manipulated by by what the society thinks it needs, and all women are saying in every country and of every group, 
is, look, this is our basic health concern. This is our body, and whether we have, whether we can control how many children we have, or if we have children, is the most basic health issue. It's the most basic determinant of whether we're poor or not, whether we're educated or not. You know, it's just simple rationality. And free. Yeah, and free. And free <laughs> that, right. that this is a question that we should be able to determine. And actually, I think that what we're establishing is a, a kind of legal and moral principle that is very important to men, too, because you might call it bodily integrity. So in the end, I think we will have a kind of umbrella principle that protects people from, what, involuntary testing, from being forced into contributing to organ transplant, I mean, things that are already uh, going on. But we're just saying the power of the state, power in general, stops at our skins. We decide what happens inside us. And it also affects the whole question of sexuality and how you choose to live and to um, what, and whatever you want to do with your body, doesn't it? I mean, it's... It, yes, totally, it's, because, because what the anti-equality, ultra-right wing, often religious but sometimes secular groups really are saying is that they oppose any form of sexuality that can't end in conception. Right. Right. And it's so important to get a grip on that because otherwise people s say, well, how come they're against both birth control and lesbianism? Yeah. <laughs> you know, why is that? Because they're it's against any sexuality that can't end in conception, at least and especially for, for women. So the same groups that oppose sex education in the schools, which would diminish the need for safe and legal abortion, oppose safe and legal abortion, even though they're, they're in, increasing the need for it. Yeah. Or the same groups that, you know, oppose uh, uh, gay marriage uh, also uh, oppose uh, equality for women inside. You know, it, it, it makes sense once you get a grip on the fact that they're uh, opposing any sexuality that can't end in conception. Now, you, you travel around the world and you see all different kinds of people, and we're just now talking about uh, reproductive freedom, and I don't want to yet talk about the Bush administration mm. because we could spend a long time on that, but the Bush administration has certainly affected in other countries this whole policy of reproductive freedom, hasn't it? Yes, it's set it back decades and decades yeah. and decades, not only because um, they, uh, I mean, they don't support sex education here, much less there, there. but they also don't su support the distribution of condoms, uh, even though that is directly related to AIDS and disease as well as to reproduction. They, there, there are ayatollahs, or um, I shouldn't insult the ayatollahs because they're probably more <laughs> liberal than Bush in many ways, but the, you know, the, it's, yes. it, it is truly, truly, truly outrageous and it has a huge penalty uh, for the environment, uh, you know, for... It's so far-reaching. Uh, uh, absolutely everything is affected by this h huge, unwanted surge in population. You were just recently in Africa? Yes, uh, in Botswana. And did you see, um, res I mean, the effect of this policy there? Is that an issue well, there or not? Yes, no, it, 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 is. It, it, is, it is a big issue. Botswana happens to be the country in which the infectious rate of, of HIV and AIDS is the highest. Uh, and part of the reason it's the highest uh, is because the most ancient culture, continuous culture on earth, the, the Kwe or San people, known as the Bushmen, uh, uh, colloquially, um, are... They are, are the oldest? Yeah, they're the oldest continuous culture, and now we know from DNA trails that they are the ancestors of all of us, of all of us. And it is an immensely sophisticated amazing culture that, that is as skilled and uh, interested in exploring inner space as we are at exploring outer space, um, that no, has incredible pharmaceutical knowledge. I mean, the, the, the women uh, took us out in the Kalahari with their digging sticks and they, I mean, this was 10 years ago, which is the first time yeah. I went, and they showed us uh, the plants they use for contraception, the plants they use for abortifacients, the plants they use for headaches, for migraine headaches, to render themselves sterile. And there's an admission of the sophistication on the part of the pharmaceutical companies that have now discovered and are trying to patent uh, a, dr uh, a plant they use when food is scarce but energy is important. And of course, it turns out to be the perfect diet drug, so now <laughs> everybody's using <laughs> it. 
At the same time, uh, there's, there's a terrific racism and condescension directed toward them uh, in the same way, I might add, that we pioneered with Native Americans in, in, in this country. So that people, leadership in the government will say, well, they're like the dodo bird, you know, either they modernize or die, or uh, people and animals can't live together or whatever. So they are forcing them off their own land, constitutionally guaranteed to them in the central Kalahari, into resettlement camps that are disasters. I mean, I, I, we went to the one that the government points to as like the best. Who, what's the government? The, the, the government of Botswana, yeah, it's, it's, it's a democratic just, government, mm -hmm. and, and, and in many ways it's exemplary. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the <laughs> deep bed of contempt and the colonization of, of, of minds, you know, that mm -hmm. results in, in feeling that it's better to have a Cadillac than to be dressed in skins and, you know, right. living in the desert, is, you know, is, I'm sure, a long-term effect of of colonialism. Um, I didn't mean to derail you, just, I'm sorry. Well, so they're in the prison, they're in these, they're, yeah, they're yeah, like so they're, prison camps, they're, they're compounds. They're like, the, yes, yeah. and, and in, when, when living 10 years ago, for instance, there were only a few thousand still allowed to, still, you know, on the land, uh, AIDS was unknown, really. I mean, they're living in their, tr their 60,000 year old sophisticated <laughs> way with nature, com you know, understanding you know, the best conservationists ever, wherever uh, <laughs> indigenous people are, the biodiversity is much more better than where the conservationists are. Uh, but once they're forced off into these camps with nothing to do, no jobs, uh, even the people who construct the camps are from somewhere else. So the women and girls are uh, forced or have to choose prostitution, AIDS becomes a big problem and there you are. You know, and it's the direct result of resettlement. It's, so, what can you do? So, you're there. This is the current. This is what you were just recently doing. Yes, right, right. And and and, um, and you know, it may seem removed to people who are listening, but I mean, these. First of all, these are the ancestors of us all. <laughs> Secondly, they have so much knowledge and uh, hope and understanding that we need all of their, as with Native Americans groups to some extent too. All of their social structures have one goal, consensus uh, and cooperation. Their games, the goal of their games is cooperation. I mean, we, you know, there's a game in which you sort of twirl around and throw a ball while singing a song. <laughs> so somebody can catch it, not so they can't. What a concept, you know. <laughs> and and so much we could it's, learn. It's, it's because they haven't acquired, I mean, they don't have things to acquire, right, other than the appreciation and the nature they live with. Well, it, it's uh, what changes they do have, us. They they do have things. I think uh, if, I believe, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. But what what changes us is the way we're raised. I think we have to be raised to be insecure and to have a a hole inside of us that, that it, it must be filled by possessions or work or alcohol. But it started with some generation, so something had to. Yeah, I think I think yeah, that that um, that the it started with having too many children, and therefore you could no longer raise them the way right. indigenous cultures in general and and the the San people in particular raise their children, which is in total body contact all the time with great mm -hmm. love until they're six or so, and a lot of independence. But you know, if you have, if a woman has six children, you you can't do that. They have two or three children, two or three years apart. But I can't resist. But I mean, feminists who are always accused of uh, rejecting the nurturing, or frequently accused of rejecting the nurturing role and going back to work and doing all mm -hmm. that, we're going to say that you know, here we are defying that concept of yes, right. It was never and everything. Yeah. Uh, no, and the men, a, the men, the men hugged the men did the children same thing. too. Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, was I mean, it I was industrialization. I mean, did, but society it started was that before way, that. Bef way before that. Yeah, but but it's, remember that the last fifty to sixty thousand years are less than five percent <laughs> of human history. We've been around a long time, and every year right. they figure out we've been along, around longer than they thought. <laughs> so, for ninety-five percent of human history, before five to eight thousand years ago, there were very, very, very different cultures. And uh, we see it in this country, or we should see it in this country, with the because Native yeah, with yeah. the Native American cultures, there were 500 nations when the Europeans showed up here. There was a settlement the size of London in the Middle West. 
uh, the Iroquois Confederacy was not only, as we finally admit, the model for our Constitution, but it was also the uh, inspiration for the suffragist movement because the status of women, I mean, they could see a society in which the status of women was equal and powerful and so on, and so they could see that it was possible. It was probably the main part of the Underground Railway. Uh, right. Because, the suffrage, yes. right. The suffragette. And then the abolitionists and the suffragettes. Yeah, but I just mean together. because Native yes. Americans had territory and because, I see what you mean. And because the, the, the way you lived, if you believed in the way, you were okay regardless of what, <laughs> you know, where you yeah. came from. Uh, so they were uh, probably the biggest part of the Underground Railway. Uh, and uh, there was, a, you know, it's part of the reason there's was so much uh, intermarriage between uh, Americans of African descent and indigenous groups already here. So interesting. Back to Botswana for a minute. Um, the irony of it, of a simple colony, is that you picketed it in front of De Beers' uh, Yes, well, jewelry. one of the, the, the there, 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 there are multiple reasons why this is happening, as there always are, and contempt and racism is, uh, you know, a fertile ground for them all. But it's also true that De Beers is the main source of income for the government of Botswana. So whether or not direct diamond mining uh, is the cause of, of displacing the San people, which many people believe it is because they've discovered diamonds mm -hmm. in the Kalahari, mm -hmm. or because they have a moral responsibility because they're the main financial support. In either case, uh, De Beers uh, is going to be held responsible. Uh, and you know, diamonds are not like something we need, and it's an entirely artificial market anyway. And, I'm, and the women's movement is probably already very pissed at their public relations <laughs> campaign because <laughs> having, yeah. having falsely sold us diamonds, you know, they created the, di the diamond market. Yeah. And people bought mainly colored stones before, but they put it in the movies and they <laughs> restricted the supply and they made it seem like a rare very and good valuable, thing. Right. Right. So now they're trying to say that, oh yes, so now you have your left hand diamond, which shows you got a man. Now you need a right hand diamond to show your own personal accomplishment. <laughs> have you seen it? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I mean, it makes it very painful to shake hands, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> so let's come back to this country and let's talk about where we are now. You're a great believer in one of the things you will, you say you're a hopeaholic. Hope -a <laughs> yeah. How do you pronounce it? Hope hopeaholic. Right. Hopeaholic. <laughs> right. That you always have hope that it's going to change, and you you've always been interested in politics and active in it and increasing participation and stuff. How did we get where we are? Well, I think uh, first of all, in backlash against change. You know, we should remember that if we hadn't had a front lash, you know, which means the civil rights movement and, and the anti-war movement and the women's movement and the gay rights and the environmental, yeah. this what's happening now is a backlash against all of that. Um, but really, we have to take responsibility for who votes and who doesn't. We have allowed ourselves to get cynical about politics, turn, which I think has been carefully cultivated, incidentally. I but remember when it started. It's not hard to fall into in that trap. No, but, but I remember in 1968 when Nixon in, kind of invented mm -hmm. the tactic of suppressing the vote by pretending he was just like Jack Kennedy. Right. If you go back and look at the 60 debate, the famous 1960s, yeah. he's sitting there saying, oh, yes, I, we fear the same about the issues. Yeah. We just have minor differences. Those were two very different guys, yeah. you know. So that was <laughs> the birth of the uh, they're just alike because he could look at the polls and see right. that the Republicans did not represent the majority of opinion in this country uh, on most issues. And it's still true, except on, on gay marriage and capital punishment, they don't represent the majority on anything. So they kind of pretend to, to be either issueless or mushy, you know, during the general election while right. having, you know, got out their vote in the, in the primary, of course. Uh, and it's, ca it's caused the suppression of the vote. And the, the media hasn't helped because the media's idea of objectivity is being even-handedly negative. Right. You know, so it yeah. tends to make the two sides seem much more the same than they are. Is it also, do you think, a result of, of what I think is a semi-demise of the Democratic Party? Or having lost its no, I don't true think so. Soul. Well, do you think it? it yes really and no. Still, I mean, I mean, because I, I think in a, 
in a, in a kind or both of both parties. I mean, the Republican Party is is right. as splintered or is as different. Well, there is no Republican Party right. and there That's is right. no Democratic right. Party. The difference is that the a lot of uh, groups like from the National Rifle Association to the 8,000 Fundamentalist Baptist Churches to all you know all of these groups and economic interests took over the Republican Party platform. While we, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the majority, the center to progressive majority, 70% of the country, the right wing represents 30% at most, kind of sit around and say, why don't the Democrats do something? Instead, their issue groupings did it. And that's, you know, what we have but to do. We have to not say what the Democrats are doing, but say, what are we doing? Right, exactly. Yeah. But what are we doing? I mean, I remember platform hearings where you were, conventions mm -hmm. where you were, and I was, and we were in there. I'm not. I'm not in there anymore. I don't know if you still go to those, things, but no. you don't even hear about them anymore. You don't hear about people trying to get something into the Democratic platform because there basically is no Democratic platform, right? Well, no, there is it's a Democratic become platform. Groups that that do it more independently and don't form. No, they're, they're you know they they do have platforms, but yeah. but I th but I think the platform the platform is important. If you get your issue in it, it's good. Well, if you don't get your issue in it, it's not good. If you get it in, it doesn't matter. You know, it's exactly you know, right. that's true okay. too. So, but, so I'm just I'm more talking about organizing the turnout of the, the vote. vote. For right. instance, in this last uh, presidential year, I campaigned with the Planned Parenthood Action right. Fund, which for the first time in its history had supported had endorsed a presidential candidate. It was a revelation. You know, I mean, Planned Parenthood is trusted in this country in a way and used by one in three women and many you know yeah. in a way that the political parties are not if we use those kinds of groupings our environmental groupings our health groupings our unions our civic we can we have many more people than they do but we've been sitting around on our behind voting zero to fifty percent while they vote ninety percent of their membership they say and i have no reason to doubt that right we could go on forever and i'm we're getting near the end of the program and i'm frustrated by it, but um, <laughs> we opened up the process of nominations of candidates. And it seems to me when we opened up that process, we changed the dynamic of elections. It becomes a more personal campaigning, the fundraising, of course, the, ca the campaigns are so expensive. Uh, the ability to really affect a nomination, it's, it's mm -hmm. there and it's not there. And then it becomes the responsibility of organizations that are interested in some of the issues that they go out, as you said, and turn out the vote. Mm -hmm. But we've changed that dynamic of politicking, I think. Now, I'm not well, sure it's for the better. You know, it, it has become much more know, personalized. And, the, you know, I mean, many things have happened. We've lost the fairness doctrine, so we don't get reporting right. on issues. Uh, but I and everything you say is true. But I think we need to th think of it like this: there's a pyramid, right? And the right wing has all their issue groupings at the bottom, and then they have their uh, think tanks and money sources, and they build the pyramid. And by the time the pyramid is built, they don't really care who's on top. They don't care if, as right mm -hmm. now, they have a guy who, if he weren't born into the Bush family, couldn't be selling used cars. They don't <laughs> care because they have uh, this pyramid. We conversely say who's going to be the candidate and expect the yeah. candidate to build the pyramid exactly. every four years, which exactly. is not possible. Right. So we're responsible for building the base of this pyramid. So, and you, and you think that we do that from those issues that concern us yes, that's right. that we have to trust, trust those and surround. People, you, you and I probably, uh, even though, <laughs> you know, are probably as trusted or perhaps more trusted, even if, you know, feminists per se are more trusted than doctors, lawyers. So, yeah. you know, we, we need to use that credibility and stop saying, what is somebody else going to say? I mean, if, if I go on a, a college campus, as I did, you know, before the election, and say, how many of you uh, are going to graduate in debt? A forest of hands go up, you know, because kids now have more debt than the average family. How many of you know that it's gone up 30 percent just since George Bush took office, and student loans have gone down because his That's bankers' friend, friends were taken? That alone, that alone, sends people to the polls.
more arsenic in the water that alone sends people to the polls and it's up to us to just that it's simple just one issue that you care about send you to the polls so how do you how do you organize that nationally well you from the from the from the issue but from you look for the organizations in your own life and in your neighborhood that are trusted and you that's how you get the message out but we have to find all these people like you it's very hard no 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 there are plenty of people I mean, you, you, know, you um it, you were just not they're sitting around saying you know Ed, well, you waiting go, for you somebody have, else to do it you yeah. go out and, and meet all these people and you come back really inter- I mean it's yeah. really right it invigorates you absolutely if, if, if and, I just read the newspapers we haven't even discussed the war in Iraq and we have to do that we have one minute left uh huh. Well, <laughs> would that we could get out in one minute. Right. I mean, you know, we certainly have become the a great recruiting mechanism for terrorists around the world by what we're doing in Iraq. It's really uh, so. When you go out and speak, do you find that the the overwhelming number of people feel that we shouldn't be there? Now, yes. In the beginning, it's changed. It, in the beginning, it was kind of uncertain. It was there was a kind of well, we were wrong to get in, but now that we're there, we might as well, you know. The, but but now it's it's different, and I think what's making the difference uh, are are guys coming home and and women coming home from Iraq and saying what their experience has been, and families of people who will never come home from Iraq, and also the understanding that we have a draft. It's just the most unfair draft in history. We have a poverty draft, poor people. We have an education draft, kids. Who can no longer afford an education end up in the National Guard and they end up in Iraq. We have a green card draft, you know, right. because right. right. So it's it's everybody except the kids of the people, people who are, are making in Congress. These. Yeah, right, right. Well, we've ended this program and it's gone so quickly, as as fast as our lives are going past us, <laughs> yes, as we talked right, about right. our age. Right. <laughs> I certainly hope you'll come back again because we have so much that we didn't even talk about, and right. you are so um, absolutely. Perfect, I think, well, in what Ronnie, you say. You've and made so me what I am today. No, I have not. <laughs> Thank you very much. You Gloria. were there first. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.